Let's turn to Acts, the 11th chapter. Tonight we begin with verse 27. Oh, then Saturday follows the pancake breakfast with Gail Irwin, our special guest this week. And if you don't go to that, then we expect to see you up at Twin Peaks. And uh, we have another work day this Saturday, and we've got a lot of things to do this, this week. We've got more demolition work, but then we also, uh, it's, it's nice when you uh, get to the other side, and now we've got a lot of putting together work, uh, putting together the, the rooms uh, upstairs, uh, getting the rooms all furnished. The furniture is there. It's just now getting them uh, together, putting the uh, beds together and so forth. And uh, so that's uh, a lot to be done uh, as we hope to open that this summer. So uh, appreciate your help. In those days, there came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, uh, we have observed that the Lord has opened the doors in Antioch to the Gentiles. There was a definite outreach to the Gentiles there in Antioch. And the beginning of the work of God's Spirit in a very powerful way among the Gentiles, the church in Antioch uh, began to flourish Barnabas was sent there to sort of oversee the ministry. And when he saw what was going on, especially among the Gentiles, he knew that Paul would be the ideal person uh, to come and to minister there in Antioch. And so he went to Tarsus, searched for Paul, found him, and invited him to come and to share with him in the ministry of Antioch, at Antioch. And they were there for a year, uh, teaching many people. And uh, so in these days there came prophets from Jerusalem to the church in Antioch. In the early church, uh, there was a ministry of prophets. Uh, they were gifted men that God had set in the church as a part of that uh, team that God ordained. Uh, there was first of all the apostles, then the prophets, then the evangelists, then the pastor teachers. And the ministry was the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the complete or fully matured man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more as children who are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine and slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. This particular passage of Scripture came as a real revelation to me in my ministry years ago, I was taught and trained that the primary purpose of the church was the evangelization of the world. And I believed that in every sermon I preached and was an evangelistic sermon. I really never taught the Word of God. I was constantly preaching evangelistic sermons. As a result, the believers did not really mature 
in their Christian experience. In the book of Hebrews chapter 6, it said, uh, therefore, leaving the first principles of the doctrines of Christ, uh, the repentance, baptisms, laying on of hands. Let's go on into maturity. But I had never taken the congregations that I pastored into real maturity because I was constantly feeding them uh, the pablum and uh, the baby food, giving them the bottles and never really teaching the word of God. And I thought that that was what the church was all about. But as I was reading the book of Ephesians one day, and I saw here, and it just was, I'm sure, uh, impressed upon my heart by the Holy Spirit, that the church exists, first of all, for the Lord, that we might gather and fellowship with him. John said, these things write we unto you that you uh, might fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's the primary purpose of the church, fellowshipping with the Lord. But then I believe that the church, in a secondary sense, exist as a place of the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And thus I believe that work of the ministry, evangelism, is really sort of the third aspect of the church as we become strong, as we mature, as we are brought into the stature of the image of Christ, then we automatically become witnesses uh, because of the work of God's Spirit conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. And so that evangelism is actually the byproduct of a healthy church. And surely we have seen that as uh, the body has matured, as the believers have matured in their walk and in their relationship with the Lord. Uh, your life becomes a witness and uh, a living epistle known and read of all men. So that uh, evangelism is just the byproduct of the healthy church. And, of course, uh, we have seen more evangelism uh, than we ever saw seeking to be evangelistic and making that the primary goal of the church. So uh, God has give, given to the church gifted men and the the three ministries basically I believe pastor teacher is a combination uh, but uh, the apostles and uh, the well the fourfold I guess the apostles the uh, prophets the evangelists and then pastor teachers Paul when he wrote to the Corinthians there in chapter 12 asked the question are all apostles? The answer is no. Are all prophets? The answer is no. Are all teachers? And again, the answer is no. God has given certain men the gift of an apostle, others the gift of an evangelist, others the gift of a prophet, and the others the gift of pastor teachers. And so the gift of the prophet was a recognized ministry in the early church. And it would appear that they were sort of nomads, that they would just go around from church to church and exercise their gift of prophecy within the church. And so here at Antioch, there came a group of prophets, men with that gift, to the church in Antioch uh, to minister to them. Now problems did arise in the early church because 
a, a lot of the churches were very new. Uh, the leadership wasn't really experienced. And these fellows would come in and claim to have the gift of a prophet and would uh, seek to exercise that gift in the church. Well, uh, he's a stranger. You've never seen him before. Is he a true prophet of God? And, and there were men who were actually false prophets. And, and they would go around claiming uh, this gift of a prophet. And uh, they would be ripping off the churches. And so the apostles saw the need of sort of setting a little manual for the churches uh, so that the churches could sort of identify if a fellow was a true prophet or not. And the interesting thing is that uh, the identity of the false prophet was the emphasis that he put upon himself and money. So that according to this little manual that was uh, created by the apostles called the Didache, uh, if a man came in, said he was a prophet, and if he stayed more than two days without going to work, then he was a false prophet. In other words, you, you accept him the first day, and that's fine, and, and you feed him and all, but if he stays... <laughs> longer and not doesn't have show any indication to work then he's a false prophet if he comes and in the name of the lord he orders you to prepare a great feast for the poor people if he himself ate of that feast he was a false prophet in other words looking out for himself. Some, you know, thus saith the Lord, prepare a great feast and feed the poor, you know. And uh, wonderful. It's not, you know, beyond the Lord to ask us to do something like that. But if a fellow does that and then is, you know, scarfing it up himself, then mark him as a false prophet. In Peter's second letter, in chapter 2, he gave, again, some instructions, guidelines uh, of discerning false prophets. It actually begins in uh, the f first chapter, verse 21, where Peter declares that the prophecy in the old time uh, did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But, Peter said, there were false prophets also among the people. In other words, recognizing we've got false prophets that are out there now. And even in the Old Testament, there were false prophets among the teacher, uh, people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately will bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Through feigned words, seek to make merchandise of you. There are many self-proclaimed prophets and evangelists, many of them on TV, on radio, who would definitely classify by Peter's definition as false prophets <clears throat> because through feigned words they are seeking to make merchandise of you. People, I think, like to uh, 
oh, play practical jokes, you might say, upon me. And they'll send my name into some of these fellows and I start getting monthly letters. And every gimmick that you could possibly think of, these guys have already thought of it. And, and you can't believe the, the things that are sent out uh, as they are seeking to uh, fleece the flock of God. The feigned words. You can set up a computer so that it will type the same letter, only changing the name. There was one that used to write, we got his letters here at the church. And the poor computer didn't know the difference between Calvary Chapel and the first and last name of a person. So dear Mr. Chapel, <laughs> God laid you on my heart and I've been praying for you all week long. There must be something seriously wrong. Why don't you write and tell me about it so that I can pray more specifically for you? Mr. Chapel, God loves you and he's interested in you and and I'm interested also, and I can't get over the heavy burden on my heart every morning when I get up to just hold you up before the Lord. Please use the enclosed envelope and tell me what's going on that I can pray for you more directly. And by the way, if you could enclose, you know, a check. I really am desperately needing money now. And I'm amazed at how all of these men of faith seem to always be needing money desperately. But Peter declares that, you know, through feigned words, they'll seek to make merchandise of you. Now, there came these prophets, and these were genuine prophets from Jerusalem, they came to minister to the church in Antioch, exercising their gifts. And it is interesting that in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, we read that there were certain prophets in the church in Antioch. Now, whether or not those in chapter 13, you see chapter 12 is really sort of a parenthetical type of a chapter. We have moved now to the work of the Spirit among the Gentiles. We've moved to Antioch. But now some things have happened in Jerusalem, and so Luke uh, feels it's necessary to uh, bring to your attention what was happening in Jerusalem. And uh, we'll get that when we get into chapter 12, that Herod stretched forth his hand against the church and had uh, James uh, killed and imprisoned Paul, intending to bring him forth. And we'll get that story in chapter 12. But the 11th chapter ends with the church in Antioch and the prophets there in the church. Throw in chapter 12 as, as just sort of an explanation of what's happening down in Jerusalem. When you get back to chapter 13, he really takes up at the end of chapter 11. Now there were certain prophets in Antioch. And the Holy Spirit said, Separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the ministry wherein I have called them. Or whereunto I have called them. So uh, these, this could be an introduction to the 13th chapter where he's going to be talking about the prophets that were in Antioch and how that the Holy Spirit through them uh, was uh, saying, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas uh, for the ministry wherein to have called them. So, uh, very real possibility. In the New Testament, as we pointed out in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about uh, men who were 
called as prophets. Men called as apostles, called as prophets, called as evangelists, called as pastor teachers. But there was also mentioned in the New Testament the gift of prophecy. And uh, in the uh, 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, it speaks of uh, the gift of prophecy as one of the uh, nine that were mentioned in the early part of chapter 12, uh, one of the vocal gifts of the Spirit. In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is uh, giving instructions uh, concerning uh, women uh, who were praying and prophesying without a veil over their heads. And uh, because of the local conditions there in Corinth, uh, it was suggested by Paul that they wear a veil, a head covering. Uh, but he did not forbid them exercising the gift of prophecy. In the promise of the Holy Spirit, back in the Old Testament, the book of Joel, it said, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. But sons and daughters prophesying. And so it was allowed and accepted in the early church for women to exercise that gift of prophecy. Now, Paul tells us in the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians that he that prophesied spoke to the church for edification, for exhortation, and for comfort. And so the gift of prophecy was oftentimes exercised within the church to build up the church, to edify the church. And thus the gift of prophecy often is, is that of encouragement. Uh, the encouragement uh, to trust in the Lord and uh, the, uh, of, of God's greatness and God's ability and God's power and, and to get you focused upon the Lord rather than on your problems. And, and as such, a very important gift in the church to build up the body of Christ, uh, building them up spiritually, uh, building up their faith. There was the exhortation, and that is, of course, uh, exhorting them to put their trust in the Lord, exhorting them to be a real witness, exhorting them to keep their lives pure and unspotted from the things of the world. The classic example of one who had a gift of exhortation and does have a gift of exhortation, Pastor Romain. He'll get you off of the duff and get you out there and get you going, you know. And uh, it, that's the exhorting of, of putting the scriptures to work in your life. And of course, then comfort. God is on the throne. God hasn't forsaken you. God's going to take care of this situation. And, and the comfort. And so this is how the gift of prophecy was used in the early church. So that, for the most part, it wasn't like the Old Testament prophets who did exhort, who did edify, but oftentimes with the Old Testament prophets there was more of an element of foretelling of the future, what was going to happen. 
That wasn't the case with the New Testament prophets. However, interestingly enough, in the passage we have tonight, that was the case. This one particular prophet, Agabus, that we'll come across again when we get to the 20th chapter. He, his prophecies here and in the 20th chapter were actually foretelling what was going to happen. But that generally wasn't the tenor of the exercise of the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. Uh, it was more just uh, words of comfort, exhortation, and edification for the church. In the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul said, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, if I don't have love, I am nothing. So, of course, the 13th chapter, the supremacy of love, even over the manifestations or the gifts of the Spirit, and, and he specifically mentions the gift of prophecy. In chapter 14, he then gives instructions concerning the exercise of the gift of prophets, prophecy. In, uh, he declares there in the 14th chapter that he that prophesies is greater than he that speaks with tongues, unless there's an interpretation. The tongues were to be limited to two at the most three. But with prophecies, let the prophets speak two or three and let the others judge. And if anything be revealed to another is, that is sitting by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one at a time, that all may learn and that all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophet. And I think uh, that is an important thing to note. There are some people that sort of indicate or try to intimate that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were out of control. Uh, that the Holy Spirit sort of took over motor functions of their body and all. And uh, I've seen a lot of things blamed on the Holy Spirit that were not the fault of the Holy Spirit. Paul told Timothy not to neglect the gift that was in him and was given to him by prophecy and the laying on of the hands of the elders. So uh, in another place he told Timothy to stir up the gift. So Timothy had received a gift and Paul doesn't tell us what that gift was. But he received it by the laying on of hands by the elders and the prophecy that came forth spoke of the gift that God was giving to Timothy. And it seemed like Timothy was in danger of neglecting that gift. So in the New Testament... The gift of prophecy was more a forth telling, speaking forth the word of God, the truths of God, more than it was a foretelling, that is the predicting of future events. Now, if I am speaking forth the word of God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, there is always that possibility that there might be an aspect of the foretelling of the future or things that will happen or transpire. Now, we sort of center in on this fellow Agabus. We read in verse 28... 
there stood up one of them named Agabus. And he signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all of the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So here he is foretelling a famine that is going to come when Claudius Caesar is ruling there in Rome. It's well known from history that there were several famines in the reign of Claudius. The historian Dion Cassius mentions a severe famine in the first and second year of the reign of Claudius, which was sorely felt in Rome itself. And this famine induced Claudius to build a port at Ostia that they might have more regular shipments to Rome with provisions. A second famine happened in the fourth year of his reign, which continued for several years, and it greatly affected the land of Judea. And several authors make mention of this particular famine, especially Josephus, in his book, The Antiquity of the Jews, book 20, chapter 2, section 5. And there he says that uh, Tiberius Alexander uh, su succeeded to the procuratorship in the place of uh, Cuspius Vatus. And he says that during the government of these procurators, a great famine afflicted Judea, and many died for want of food. And during this time, Helena, Queen Helena, sent some of her servants to Alexandria with money to buy great quantities of corn. She sent others to Cyprus to bring back quantities of dried figs, which she distributed to the people who were in need there in uh, Jerusalem. The third famine is mentioned by Eusebius, the early church historian. That commenced in October of AD 48 and was so powerful that it was reported that in Greece, Amodius, which is about a half a bushel of grain, was sold for six drachmas, which would be about $7. And the same author mentions another famine in Rome in the 10th year of Claudius, of which Orosius uh, gives the details. The fourth famine took place in the 11th year. This guy was plagued as, with famines as a ruler in Rome. It's mentioned by uh, Tacitus, uh, in which he relates that there was so great a dearth of provisions and famine in consequence that it was esteemed a divine judgment. At this time, the same author tells us that all of the stores of Rome there were no more than 15 days provision, and had not the winter been uncommonly mild, the utmost distress and misery would have prevailed. This Claudius, the emperor, was the same one who expelled all of the Jews from Rome. And it was at that time that Priscilla and Aquila were expelled from Rome. And so uh, we read in uh, Acts 18, uh, where Paul came to Corinth, and there he met Priscilla and Aquila, who were also tent makers. And uh, they had recently come from Rome when Claudius had expelled all of the Jews from Rome. And uh, when we get to the 18th chapter, we'll take a closer look at this neat Christian couple who had such a great ministry. They had a church in their home. Uh, they uh, were in Corinth and helped Paul in the ministry there. Uh, they went on over to Ephesus. And uh, when Paul came to Ephesus, he joined up with them again. And uh, they uh, aided Paul in the ministry there in Ephesus. 
And ultimately they move back to Rome. And when Paul writes his letter to the Romans, he encourages them to greet Priscilla and Aquila and those that were in uh, the church that was in their home. And so uh, they're, they're, they're on my list of people I want to meet when I get to heaven. Uh, I love uh, the kind of people that they are who uh, just uh, are active in business, but yet their true business is the Lord's business. And they work at making tents only so they can uh, witness for the Lord and, and live their lives for him. And great couple, and it'll be fun to meet them uh, when we get to heaven. We read now that then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren that dwelt in Judea. So here they are in Antioch, Gentiles. These prophets come from the church in Jerusalem. This specific prophet, Agabus, by the Spirit, tells that there's going to be a famine, a great famine throughout the world. And so these people then determine that they're going to collect some money and send it to the church there in Jerusalem to send relief to the brethren which dwelt there in Judea. And so we read the disciples, every man according to his ability. And that's the way our giving should be, according to our ability. That's the standard of giving. In Ezra chapter 2, verse 69, it says, They gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work uh, 61,000 drams of gold, 5,000 pounds of silver, and 100 priest garments. In Nehemiah 5.8 it said, And I said unto them, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold as slaves to the heathen. So the giving after one's ability. When Paul was encouraging the church in Corinth, to take up an offering that he might take it to Jerusalem for the poor brethren there. He said, as each man has purposed in his own heart, so let him give. And Paul adds, for God loves a cheerful giver. So giving should be according to our ability and according to as we have purposed in our own hearts. It should never be something that we feel obligated or we feel pressured, uh, but it's just as unto the Lord from my heart according to my ability. Here they are determining to send relief to the brethren which dwelt in Judea. This is Christianity in action. It's a good picture of what the Lord intended for the body of Christ. And uh, the, the, Paul, in talking about the body of Christ, said, if one member suffers... They all suffer. And if one is exalted, then they are all exalted. And uh, sort of laying out for us the fact that no man lives unto himself. But we do have an obligation and a responsibility to, according to our abilities, help those who are in need. And uh, here they are in Antioch taking up an offering for those down in Judea. In 2 Corinthians 
Paul said, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according that a man hath, and not according to that that he hath not. It really isn't how much you give, but it is giving with a willing mind. Now, it may be that you have a heart that is very generous, but you don't have anything to give. But God sees your heart. And God rewards according to what your heart is in the situation. So there's first, he said, a willing mind, and that's accepted by God. According to that which a man has, not according to that which you don't have. For I do not mean that other men should be eased and you should be burdened. But there should be an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. And the day may come when their abundance also may be a supply for your needs. There needs to be an equality. In balancing, as it is written, he that had gathered, let me read that again, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. So the money was then given to Paul and Barnabas uh, to take to the uh, church in Jerusalem. So the which also they did and sent it by the elders or to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So this is the second trip back to Jerusalem for Saul after his conversion. Uh, the first time they were reluctant to receive him. You can be sure now that he's bringing a, a lot of money, they'll be receiving him more openly this time. Uh, but um, later on, Paul again will be soliciting money from the Gentile churches to take Jeruz to Jerusalem uh, at a later date. Now, the fact that the church in Jerusalem was in financial straits going through financial difficulty was probably uh, due to the fact that they sought to develop sort of a communal living where those who accepted Christ moved by love and perhaps emotion, not necessarily the spirit, began to sell their possessions and bring the money and lay it at the apostles' feet so that the church became sort of a depository and also the welfare center. So every man was given according to his need as uh, the wealth was distributed by the church to the congregants according to their needs. That's fine as long as you have a fresh supply of funds coming in. But after the death of Ananias and Sapphira who had uh, sort of used this as a means of drawing attention to themselves and lying to God in that they sold their possession but held back part of the money but pretended to give everything. They're holding back the money was no problem. They didn't even have to sell their property. That wasn't required. But they sold it but they held back pretending to give everything and God rewarded their hypocrisy with death. But that so shook the church that it brought an end to that particular movement of 
selling everything and bringing the money in and laying it at the apostles' feet. And, and thus the fresh supply of funds was cut off. And the net result was the church in Jerusalem had great financial problems. Paul referred to them as the poor brethren in Jerusalem. And, and there was a great financial problem there in the church, which indicates to me that their selling everything and bringing the money in was probably more of a uh, emotional thing than a spiritual thing. Uh, that uh, their emotions were touched and it, it, was, it was wonderful. I'm sure God honored and blessed those that did that. But God did not require that they do that. And uh, trying to develop sort of a communal living financially was disastrous. And so hearing now that there's going to be this famine, the church there in Antioch opened up their hearts and, and decided to send relief to those in Judea. And it was probably uh, that uh, second famine uh, that uh, in the fourth year of Claudius that uh, Agabus was prophesying uh, because uh, it did affect Judea tremendously. Many, many people died as a result of that particular famine. And so the help that came from uh, the Gentiles was surely uh, well accepted. Now, as I said, as we move into chapter 12, we're going to uh, swift, uh, we're going to switch scenes. For a little while, we're going to leave Antioch. We're going to come back to Jerusalem. And we're going to see now the developing persecution against the church and the second martyr, James, the brother of John. And so as, as we move on, that's where we'll be heading in our next lesson on into chapter 12. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us as orphans, but that you have sent the Holy Spirit to guide and to direct the church. And that you have given to the church the gift of the Holy Spirit and the various gifts that come with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we do pray that those that perhaps have gifts that they've been neglecting, that they would stir up the gifts that are in them and use them, Lord, for the purposes for which you gave those gifts. Lord, we do recognize the need of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of the church life and especially in these last days. And so may the Spirit of God come afresh upon the church, upon our lives. And Lord, even tonight, maybe there are those here that you want to use in a greater way. We know, Lord, that you have a purpose for each of us. You have a plan for each of our lives. And we realize, Lord, that there are those here tonight that you want to anoint with your Spirit and give them special abilities and gifts of the Spirit. May we be open, Lord, to receive all that you have. 
In Jesus' name, amen.